Did a line one. Required by law. Oh, the cross street and How you help, and you even came back to his house and offered the door and said, hey, you know, what do you think about this?
Okay, I think we're going to be starting the September 13th meeting of the Monterey Bay Community Power <laughs> Policy Board of Directors. Uh, please call the roll. Good morning, Mr. Chair. I'm going to go to call the roll, and then immediately afterwards, I will re uh, read the revision sheet. Council Member Brown. Council Member Kaufman Gomez. Present. Council Member Termini. Here. Supervisor Parker. Here. Council Member McShane. Council Member Haffa. Council Member Delgado. <laughs> Council Member Orozco. Supervisor De La Cruz. Council Member Friend. Chair McPherson. Here. We do have a quorum. Uh, better, I should ask her if uh, there are any new board members or alternates. Uh, there are no new board members, but no alternates you know, anywhere that need to. Okay, we can move forward. Um, uh, now I would like to open up to the public for oral communications for items that are not on the agenda today. Thank you, Chairman McPherson, Kevin Day, and I'm representing a group called Clear Honest Options in Clean Energy or Choice. I sent an email yesterday to you. Hopefully staff is able to forward it to you. I was at the meeting last week for the operations committee uh, where they discussed and approved a directive to staff regarding the procurement plan and power supply mix. And as you know, this is a real critical part of the ability of this agency to provide uh, clean energy at a reasonable price for ratepayers, and I wanted to uh, within that email I had five suggestions uh, for the board uh, I was surprised that this didn't come up today for your agenda uh, But this gives you another month to look it over uh, the recommendations that were included in that memo uh, include uh, with a staff report that was presented to the operations committee uh, there was not a complete fiscal analysis of all six of the options and I think it would be very beneficial for the, the public and potential customers to know about the fiscal impact of those six portfolio options and to compare them so rather than just doing the one that was selected uh, which is the uh, portfolio content category one do all six of them. In fact, within those six, I also think that the proposal that some people want towards self-sufficiency uh, of maximizing the use of energy generation facilities within the Monterey Bay Community Power Jurisdiction, that should be divided up into uh, comparing the price with the public-private options and the wholesale uh, energy costs with the idea that all of your uh, energy should be generated by solar facilities that are built and owned by the agency uh, within the jurisdiction of the agency. I think you need to look at the price differences between that as you consider options. Uh, I also think that we need to hear more about who the certain stakeholders are who object to portfolio content category three, which would be less expensive than portfolio content category one. Uh, are the objections that these certain stakeholders have to PPC3, uh, are they valid? And are these groups threatening to use the California Environmental Quality Act uh, to uh, uh, delay things if the agency uh, chooses to go with portfolio content category three? Also at the operations committee last week, uh, some uh, stakeholder groups uh, said that they were dissatisfied with the portfolio content category one that the staff had recommended and that was chosen because it included hydroelectric. I think it would be useful for the public and potential customers to find out how much more will the electricity cost uh, under the, uh, if hydroelectric was eliminated from that particular option. Uh, finally, uh, after bringing up all these various uh, observations, uh, I think that it would be useful for the agency to proceed to establish a community advisory committee. And that would be a committee with broad, diverse participation, including from business and, and ratepayer type interests. And I would suggest uh, using the model that's been established for uh, Measure X for the Transportation Agency for Monterey County. It has 20 members and 20 alternates from all different uh, aspects of the public, and it seems to be working very well. Thank you. Anyone else from the public would like to address us on items not on the agenda? Okay, we will now move to uh, the regular. Um, excuse oh. me, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry to interject, but oh, I, excuse me. Yes. I do need to read the revision sheet 
Oh we yes, have, we I'm do sorry. Some changes to we the have agenda. a revision sheet on, uh, sheet on item seven. Okay. Yes, um, we do have a correction to item seven, and um, the new reading should be as follows. Adopt a resolution to approve the credit agreement by and between Monterey Bay Community Power as borrower and River City Bank as lender. Credit agreement in substantially final form to provide up to a $3 million non-revolving line of credit and up to a $10 million revolving line of credit. Number two, approve agreement by and among the Monterey Bay Community Power Authority of Monterey, Santa Cruz, and San Benito counties and the counties of Monterey, Santa Cruz, and San Benito guarantor agreement in substantially final form to require written approval to amend the credit agreement from the guarantors. And three, authorize the CEO to negotiate and execute both agreements on behalf of MBCP. And also there are additional materials provided. The resolution for this item is now provided as an attachment to item seven. And that's all we have today. Thank you, appreciate that. We'll um, consider that on <clears throat> when we get to item seven. Uh, we will go now to the regular agenda. The um, CEO's report on item four. And before you, if I may have the liberty to say, um, we had some real challenges, late um, blooming challenges from the state legislature about how we might operate and um, it would have really hurt us and others who were in the process of uh, with their implementation plans and so forth that were not established and had, had not launched. Um, it took a fantastic job of a lot of people calling our state legislators and at this point anything can still happen. Uh, I've learned up in Sacramento uh, a legislative session as it comes to a close, but uh, I think we are in good position to carry on with the plan of attack, so to speak, that we had. And so I just want to say to everybody who participated in that, and call the legislators or staff members, committee members uh, of uh, the various committees uh, in Sacramento, that their efforts were very much appreciated and I think they're going to be successful. Now anything can happen, the session doesn't close until I think 4 a.m. Uh, or Saturday morning or Friday night, however you want to put it. But uh, I think we're in good position that we can carry on as planned and um, I just heard that from our um, representative lobby up, up in Sacramento just 10 minutes ago that uh, we're in very good position. Uh, some things may still be tried, but uh, I don't think you want to go through that complicated uh, scenario of what can happen and can't happen. The, the long and short of it is we were, it was a huge threat to us and how we might operate, and I think we're going to be able to proceed as we have planned. And now I'll give it to uh, our CEO, Tom Habashi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, a few things to report on today. One is I want to report on California CCA. This is, um, um, spell the acronyms, it's California Community Choice Association. This association was put in place back in uh, June of last year um, and um, it requires to join it that we have an implementation plan in place and submitted and also to put an application in place. We have done both and now we are a, a full-fledged member of, um, a voting member of Cal CCA. The association has been um, working tirelessly on our behalf, especially this last weekend, in order to, um, uh, to affect uh, legislation as well as uh, regulatory issues that are being discussed in, in uh, San Francisco. I'm happy to report that we are a member. Uh, right now, it doesn't cost us any money to become a member because we are not making any money, but once we do begin um, uh, to make money next year, and then we are likely to uh, be paying a membership that will be something north of $50,000 annually. I um, want to very quickly touch on uh, legislative updates and, and um, uh, Chairman McPherson already uh, uh, talked about it. Uh, these are two different bills that were introduced Friday around five o'clock in the evening. Um, both of them had language that could have been harmful to our interests and uh, we've worked uh, around the clock over the weekend on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday uh, to try to amend the language uh, and make it more acceptable to us. Eventually, both legislation were not amended, and uh, one of them is already in committee, the other one is in the Rules Committee, and I have very little understanding of how these things work, probably certainly not as, as well as uh, Chairman McPherson does. 
Um, but it's my understanding now that this is likely uh, both bills are likely to be made two-year bills and they're going to come back in the next session. This session is going to end this Friday. Uh, I'm glad uh, uh, the bills are now moving forward. They would have been harmful to our interest, not fatal. I, I want to be sure to make that point very clear. Uh, neither of the bills would have been uh, devastating to, to, um, to us to the point where we would want to stop the progress, but certainly they would have been a little more harmful that, than we uh, would have liked them to be. Uh, so I, I'll stop here and see if, um, if uh, Chairman McPherson would like to add anything. And I don't know if any of the uh, committee members would either, um, but in general it was just about the, the procurement process would have been complicated for us and cost us more is basically what the problem was going to be. And uh, that was um, going to be a huge, I, I, I can't tell you how much, that, what, how much of an impact that would have, but it could have been substantial. Yeah, it would have um, allowed Pacific Gas and Electric to acquire on our behalf a, I wouldn't say a substantial portion of the of the uh, of the renewable resources that we needed to buy or will be buying uh, over the next few years, but it certainly uh, it would have moved the decision to buy these resources to them and, and increased that um, power charge and difference adjustment that they charge us, which right now is quite substantial, I think, for some of our residents. Uh, next year that is going to run to something north of three cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, and just to put in perspective, all what we are collecting for the generation side uh, for, from residential customers is likely to be um, uh, nine cents a kilowatt hour, probably a little more than that. So basically one third of what we are collecting from our residents, we're going to hand, hand over to Pacific Gas and Electric as an exit fee, if you will. Uh, that would have been if these bills would have passed, that probably would have increased that three cents to maybe three and a half, maybe even more. Uh, with that, um, I'll move on to the reporting on regulatory did, updates. Did, did you unless, have any, unless did you there have are question? any questions? Did you have a question? Yeah, given, as the chair said, that it's not a done deal, anything can happen, um, what, could, what actions could cities take? Um, between now and Friday, as far as sending in letters, what would it be? What would be an appropriate comment to submit at this point for the legislation for these two bills? Well, I, I, they have been contacted uh, continuously or repetitively, I'd say. But if you would like to call our members, uh, in Assemblyman uh, Stone and Senator Monning and Assemblywoman Caballero in our region, have been very supportive of our efforts. Uh, if you do know some others in, in the legislature personally for one reason or another, just if you could uh, give them a call and maybe you would want a, a basic written form of something that uh, what we're after. It's, it's complicated, but, uh, but it, I think it can be simplified. If we could do that, get a one or two, three paragraph, and then you could call anybody that you know in the legislature. I can just tell you that our legislators that represent us in the state, uh, the two assembly members that I mentioned and our senator, as well as um, Mr. Canella as well, he has uh, been, been very open to hearing what we, what's on our minds as well. So uh, if, but if you know some, some members outside of that, that would be great if you could call. Okay, so I did read the emails and our city was preparing to send something. I don't know if they've sent it, uh, but I think the emails uh, especially encouraged uh, comments to the uh, to Canella's office. Yeah, because uh, he was apparently most unknown or on the fence, etc. Right. I, I I know I've had a few conversations, but I think we're going to be okay there. But I, I think in general we're all right. But it would be just let's keep at it until midnight Friday. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. The state also has a website you can go to, and it's a basically click through. You log in so that they know who you are and you look up the bill itself, maybe look up the committee, and it asks whether it's a click on whether you oppose or, or um, support the bill, and it gives you a comment field as well, so that anybody from the public can also do this. So half of our audience should be up there, register to go ahead and continue to help support this. And it just gives you that field of 
drop click the paragraph or so of the description of why you were opposing those items in these bills and also finding out who the committee members are that are involved in the language of that legislation and seeing about um, going to them and letting them know where we stand on the information to be retracted from those bills before they move them forward. Any other comments from committee members? Okay, does that conclude your report or did you, on yeah, just, item number four? Uh, no, we're still gonna talk about regulatory and, and other issues. Okay. Uh, and before we leave this one specific item, I, I do wanna give a shout out to, to um, uh, to Jenny from from your office, she's been um, a terrific help over the last uh, last week, and appreciated all the work that she's done for us. Yeah, we've been on the phone regularly. I know this. Yes, yes. <laughs> right. Um, Updates on regulatory issues. Uh, the proceeding now addressing the issues that we the problems that we had with the PCIA, basically, and I'm going to spell that out: power charge indifference adjustment. We've been having issues with that number going up and up every year, uh, and um, uh, and we were having issues with the transparency of it, uh, and with the calculations of it, and with how uh, difficult it is for us to deal with it since it changes from one year from one year to the next, and sometimes it changes substantially. And uh, I know in 2016 it went up by 100 percent, in 2017 it went up by almost 24 percent, and with with not at being able to find out what's behind that increase. Um, we've been asking for a proceeding to start on addressing the problems with the PCIA. Finally, the CPUC responded. We do now have a proceeding and the scoping of it uh, is in the process. We are looking at somewhere between 18 months to maybe 24 months before this is concluded and hopefully by then we'll have um, addressed all the issues that we have with the PCIA. That is my um, my report on regulatory issues. Uh, finally, the, um, we have a number of RFOs or an RFPs are out uh, and or will be um, in the next couple of days. Uh, the first one that's out is an RFP for data management. This is the group that will be between us and PG&E looking at all the information related, related to our customers and uh, making sure that they provide the appropriate oversight to make sure that PG&E will give us the money that are, that's due us. Also, that group will be addressing customer concerns. Uh, they will have a call center to deal with any customer calls, especially during the uh, rolling out of the program. Uh, we the, we received uh, so far uh, proposals from three different uh, entities. We will be interviewing uh, those folks not next week but the week after next and uh, begin negotiations and hopefully no later than October we'll have an agreement uh, for the data management services. There are two other requests for offers uh, will be out. One of them is for long-term power supply um, renewable power supply more specifically. We are doing that because we have an obligation under SB 350, Senate Bill 350, to make sure that 60% of all of our renewable supply is long-term supply that will be of 10 years or longer, and that we have to have that by the year 2021. In order for that to happen by the year 2021, we need to be starting negotiations for those supplies very soon because most developers, they don't build stuff then try to sell it. They actually sell it, contract for it, for 100% of it before they, they spend a penny on, on development work because the banks will not lend them the money unless they have contracts already for the long term. So we need to start that process soon. We've uh, worked with the Silicon Valley Clean Energy who is about to do the same thing, and we talked about maybe having that RFO be uh, done jointly. This way, if there are uh, resources out there that are large enough for either one of us to take uh, individually, then those resources will be coming in because they probably will be large enough for both of us to take. Um, that will not um, uh, that will not discourage any. Um, uh, developers that is developing something small because we are asking for anywhere between 50 gigawatt hours to 700 gigawatt hours. So if we get 700 gigawatt hours, 
that will be about 10% of our needs, 10% of Silicon Valley's needs. Uh, if we get anything smaller, then either one of us probably will, will work with those uh, suppliers. The bottom line is we are trying to fill in about 10% of our open position, which is at this point 100%. Um, and we're trying to do that with long-term contract. 18 months from now, we'll probably do the same thing again in order to satisfy all the requirements of um, SB 350. We will work jointly with, with the folks at Silicon Valley Clean Energy only uh, to the extent that we are negotiating contracts, but we're not going to have a single contract um, for both of us. We'll have separate contracts eventually, most likely uh, if it's for one project, then those contracts will be nearly identical. That's beneficial, obviously, to us because at this point, we don't have any credit of any kind. We don't have any money or, or uh, in the bank to, to, to be able to get a good bargain. Uh, Silicon Valley, on the, other, on the other hand, are in the plus now for about, uh, to the tune of about $20 million. So uh, certainly having them work with us and negotiate on, at the same side of the table will be helpful to our cause. And um, in addition, They already spent the money to write the RFO. Um, there will be no sense of us to duplicate that effort and spend another 50 or, or $100,000 to put that RFO together. Uh, so we'll be able to save some money on, on um, uh, going forward together. Uh, we also got another RFO. Uh, yes. is, is it um, common that you, you cooperate, shall we say, with Silic another agency like Silicon Valley? Is that yes, it's, uh, it's very common. Uh, it's done by municipal utilities uh, and has been, uh, been done by municipal utilities since the 60s, really. Uh, with a number of them coming together, they individually cannot buy anything that is large enough. They can't, th that's with the economies of scale, obviously, that you need. It's always helpful to get a whole bunch of small entities coming together to collectively buy something that's large enough to benefit from the economies of scale, then they generally would allocate it based on the based on what their needs are. So uh, it's been done by SCAPA, Southern California um, uh, Joint Action Agency. It's been done by Northern California Power Agency here up in in, uh, in Sacramento area, um, and generally it's. It's constantly being done by, by municipal utilities. This may be, may be the first time CCAs or two CCAs get together and, um, and do joint acquisition. I know that there are a number of CCAs down in Southern California. All of them are smaller ones. They all belong to cities that they've collectively put, uh, uh, put their needs together and created a joint action agency of their of the CCAs of the cities that have formed the CCAs and that joint action agency is now buying on, on, on all of their behalfs. Uh, this one is gonna be a little different because eventually we're gonna contract separately, but as far as requesting, um, uh, requesting offers, we are doing that jointly so we can get the best deal possible. Okay, any other questions? You had Good leverage. Mm -hmm. Hmm? Uh, uh, we have another RFO that will be uh, going out in the next, probably next week for the short-term supply, and that is basically to fill or to hedge all of the power supply needs that we're going to need for 2018, and then a portion of 2019, a smaller portion in 2020, then finally even maybe half of our needs for 2020, uh, for, for 2021. Um, that will be coming out pretty soon. Our expectation is when we we're going to get uh, some uh, we're going to get some proposals uh, coming our way. It will be with indicative prices. Um, then eventually, once we receive the certificate from the from the CPUC and have a contract with PG&E, that will be the time to go ahead and ask for final pricing. Uh, and in the process between now and then, which going to be December time frame, would be negotiating a, a whole bunch of enabling agreements with a, with a number of uh, suppliers. And uh, eventually, we will ask for final pricing, uh, negotiate a number of contracts, and, and uh, have that lined up for, yeah, for uh, initial operation comes March of next year. 
Yeah, go ahead. Um, the, uh, I have a question about the, the power supply mix. I see that the operations board discussed this. Um, is that coming to our board? Are you going to bring us what their recommendation was and for, for this board to have a discussion also? Yeah, the, the, um, the, the I'm sorry. Yeah, it, it is part of the redesign. I, I think we, we're not bringing exactly the same item. Uh, and since you brought the question up, I, I just want to be very clear that uh, because the gentleman in the audience brought that question up, we did look at six different scenarios and we did have numbers associated with each and every one of those scenarios basically saying, here's what will happen if you want to fill in the, the first we started with what is the absolute minimum that we need to do in order to satisfy all the, the regulations and, and uh, legislation in place and then we uh, from that we decided this is the amount of money that we're going to have left over and the question became what additional resources can we buy and for how much uh, to be able to help us get as close to 100 percent carbon free as possible and we looked at different, six different scenarios. First, we say we're going to take all that extra money, we're going to spend it on local generation only. And as it turned out, we, we can spend all that money that we have left over, 100% of it, and we still won't come anywhere near 100% carbon free because local generation is a little bit more expensive than what's available now in the market. And when I say local generation, I mean local to to Monterey Bay County, uh, Monterey Bay community uh, uh, area. Um, th then we looked at it and said, well, what can we do if we just buy these resources from and have it be developed in California, which is still more expensive, but not as expensive as, as doing it locally. And we found that we can actually um, uh, fill the gap and get to 100% carbon free, uh, but we're gonna have very little money left over uh, at the end of the year. Then we looked at a second scenario saying we're going to fill it with a type two, when type two is more of out, state, out of the state that could be bundled um, uh, here with, with local resources. Then we looked at type three, and I think the gentleman mentioned that, which is the least expensive um, type of resource that you can get, which is unbundled uh, renewable uh, certificates that you can get and bundle it with just general resources that you get that you get here from the state. We looked at that scenario as well, and for in each and every one of the cases, uh, starting with the type one, two, and three, and eventually what we are recommending to you, um, we've concluded that obviously the type one being the most expensive, type two less expensive, type three it's the least expensive, uh, and because type two and type three are now questionable, at least as, as far as uh, as far as uh, regulatory agencies, the CEC and, and CARB, questionable as as far as how much carbon fr free we can claim that these resources are, we've decided that to stay away from both of them, and instead, in order to reach 100% carbon free, to f to focus on uh, on hydro generation. The premium that we pay for that is little, hardly above type three, but at the same time, we know it's a renewable resource, we know it's a carbon-free resource, and, and we know at this point, it, uh, as far as the CEC and CARB is, uh, is uh, concerned, they, they have not questioned whether that resource is carbon-free or not. So if what we are recommended, what we recommended to the, to the operations committee is that for all the RPS requirement, for all the renewable resource portfolio re requirements that we have obligations to meet, and instead of doing it using three different types, we decided to use it only one type, which is the most expensive, the one that the, the state likes the most, which is type one. We're just gonna do all the RPS using type one uh, and instead of doing a piece from type one, two, and three. Then everything else we're gonna try to meet using large hydro. Uh, the, the, the premium that that will cost us, and that's also been shown to the, to the, the operations committee uh, and will be shared with you today, is roughly a little over $5 million um, in order to go from the absolute minimum that we can do to be able to claim that we are 100% carbon free uh, with all the RPS being met by, uh, by type one. 
uh, it, the five million dollars is, is quite reasonable we think um, it, it's not a large premium by any stretch um, and uh, and all that by the way is has been presented to the to the operations board and today we're going to share with you and we talk about the budget um, and the disposition of the of uh, surplus or net revenue we're going to talk about where that net revenue is going to go uh, so when we get to that point, I'll be more than happy to get a little bit more clear uh, about where the money is going to go. Thank you. So you're saying that if we want detail on this and we want to understand what's being recommended, that we should look at the operations board and watch their meeting for the discussion. That you're not bringing it to us to make any uh, to weigh in on that. And yeah, I was told that this is generally the the um, not in the purview of the policy committee as much as. It is in the operations committee. Uh, we, I'm definitely reporting to you on it, um, whether or not uh, I needed uh, the approval of, of the board here. Uh, that was, um, I, I'm told that that was not necessary. Right. I, I'm, uh, I'm just trying to understand how I'm going to understand what's going on. And, um, and I think one of the things that I think probably is, I mean, I would think this could be in the purview of the policy board, um, but, uh, especially in the startup, uh, maybe not so much, but I think over time the decisions about, um, for well, for one thing, I think it's important for us to understand all these things, so having more detail about it, maybe not at this point because, you know, you're, we're getting up and running, but I think for us to understand so that as we look at the next round of short-term and even long-term buying, if there's some sort of... Um, uh, set of more policy or uh, goals that we want to be able to weigh in on. Um, I think it would be good for us to understand what what we're dealing with and what the decisions are that are being made at this point and what our choices are for the future. Um, if there's you know if there's some direction that we would like to go um, to understand sort of if we want to go more towards local. If there are other uh, criteria that we want to be able to add into the decision making mix, um, it would just be important for us to not just be stabbing in the dark, um, and, but to understand it and um, be able to make informed decisions um, as time goes on. I, I, I do agree, and, and I think probably the best uh, forum and the best way to do that is uh, to put together a workshop or a retreat, if you will, with the, both the policy board and as well as the operations board to talk about some of these details and some of these policies that we need to be, that we need to put in place uh, that we can use eventually as a guide to um, to uh, operate in the future, and and won't be faced with with a, uh, with that request again because right. once you set the policy in place, now you know where the where the blueprint is. Now you know what your road looks like, and and we can the staff can follow that, uh, and uh, then everything will be understood and agreed to by uh, both boards. Yeah, that's my point, that we can set the parameters and then you don't have to come back to us every, you know, 15 minutes to ask us what we think, you know, it's, which would be crazy. Yeah, so. good point. Well taken. Yes. Um, I just have one comment on that. Um, when the operations does meet, it might be helpful if we see also maybe the minutes from their meeting to ours. I mean, we'll see their packet, but we won't necessarily know their dialogue unless we've attended their meeting, and that might be helpful for the, op uh, the policy board to see. Yeah, one of the things that, that I'm going to try to do in in uh, in the next couple of months is to make sure that the operations and the policy board don't meet in the same month. But right now, because things are hectic and decisions need to be made and meet, need to be made quickly, uh, that is taking place. But the operations board just met last week, and we had about a day to reflect some of the their comments into the packet that you have before you. And that was not an easy task by any stretch of imagination. Uh, obviously, the minutes are not anywhere being ready to, to be distributed. Um, so I, I definitely um, understand what you're saying. But to the extent that we don't have both boards meeting in the same month, then we'll have plenty of time to be able to get you, get you not just the minutes of the last month, but all the minutes from the prior months as well. Administrative yes. question. Mm -hmm. um, does the operations board meet here? Yes. yes. And are, so are they videoed and archived? So we could watch the meeting?
meeting. Yes. yes. Uh, so, good. That's helpful. And those things are posted on the Monterey Bay Community Power website, which when I went to try to access it last night, it said the domain name had expired, but maybe that was, anyway. Hmm. I'm to, not sure about that. Yeah. Anyway, mm -hmm. it was it was a little unfortunate. And I there, when I um, did a you know request for Monterey Bay Community Power, that was really the only website that was suggested. So anyway, I'll um, see what's going on. But it was a little disturbing. Okay. But your other points well taken. Any other questions? Uh, any other um, items that you have on your report? One uh, there's one more we need to talk about staffing. Then we'll. Very quickly. Yep. Then we'll go from there. Will you advance the slide? Can you advance the slide? Good morning, everybody. Um, just wanted to briefly report that the operations board last week did approve a package uh, related to staffing and employment policies for MBCP. This package included a general staffing plan, of which uh, you have a um, preliminary org chart that we're working from. Also approved a, a hiring schedule. A, a general uh, slate or roster of employee benefits along with employee policies that were codified in a very detailed employee handbook. Uh, all of that was served up in great de detail last week to the operations board and they did, uh, they did approve it. So for today, I just wanna show you what the um, initial org chart looks like for Monterey Bay Community Power um, to also point out that this is really a starting point. This is quite reflective of other CCAs around the state in terms of you know primary functions that need to occur for MBCP. And as Tom hires people, uh, this org chart will likely expand over time as your operations become grow and become more mature. The next slide, please. Thank you. Um, this is just a quick quick list of the employee benefits. Um, without a lot of detail here, there are just a couple of places I want to highlight for you. It's, it is a, um, a very generous package, uh, not overly so, but in keeping with other uh, operational CCAs around the state, as well as looking at municipal practices and the packages that are offered to their employees. A um, question had come up a couple of months ago about whether or not MBCP would be a PERS agency. This relates to the retirement uh, benefits. And um, we did look at that. We looked at, again, sort of common practice and the ability to be competitive in terms of salaries and uh, overall compensation. The bottom line is that uh, the recommendation was made that uh, MBCP would not be a, um, a PERS agency, that instead we would be a defined contribution, not a defined benefit, defined contribution, which means MBCP will make contributions to the employee's Social Security taxes. Uh, they will also offer, we will also offer a matching 401A plan um, and can contribute up to the IRS limits on a 457B plan. So a lot of this was detailed um, more last week, but that was a question that had been raised and I just wanted to circle back and let you know where it landed. Uh, the only other place where there was some discussion was in relationship to paid time off. Uh, right now we are proposing a a bundled package of paid time off that would include sick time, personal time, and vacation leave. Uh, that's a very common now. And uh, we did talk about a total of 160 hours per year, accruing more as the employee um, moves on in service. And the operations board did suggest that possibly additional PTO could be part of a recruitment strategy if Tom and others need it in the process of hiring. The rest of it is all very standard, and I'll stop there unless there are any questions. Questions from board members? Delgado. Yeah, it's just a small point on the paid time off. If it's negotiable with incoming employees, might you end up with employees working alongside each other with different benefits? <coughs> and does that have the potential of causing morale issues? I think generally we can use it as just a way, for example, if you get an employee coming with 10, 15 years of experience, they come in from an agency where they have accumulated over time, managed to get up to four weeks of vacation time instead of, as well as the sick leave and a few others, they may be more enticed to come in if, if they know that they're going to be able to get some more time off 
and to the extent that we can bring him in and do that, that I think that would be okay. Uh, if we get somebody who's young, straight out of college or just a couple of years out of college, then they probably would be more accepting of having less time off than to start with six weeks, for example. Um, I would assume that probably would not create a morale problem, uh, and I think it would probably be more advantageous to us, especially if we're trying to bring people with experience and years and years of experience. I mean, is it? Yeah, I, I don't disagree with anything you've said, but I wonder if it could also be done uh, with a pre-thought through um, policy so that every 15 ex year experience employee would get it or wouldn't get it rather than you might end up with one experienced employee getting it, the next one not asking and not getting it. So rather than leave it up to case by case, could we establish a policy that, that recognizes prior service when it comes to some of these benefits? I see your point. The very last thing I'll say just to wrap this is that uh, Tom has identified eight appreciate that. What I was questioning is challenges in our decision to not go to PERS. It uh, hasn't been an issue with any of the other CCAs? Uh, no, not that I know of. Good. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Any other items on your report? Uh, that concludes my, uh, my report, Mr. Chairman. Okay. We will... Um, Move to item number five, the approval of the M MBCP rate design and disposition of net revenue. This is an action item. Uh, probably this probably moved ahead of others, but um, just to summarize fairly quickly, what we're trying to do here is one, to decide on what our rate should be, and two, uh, to the extent that there's net uh, operating revenue, what should we do with the net operating revenue? These are the two decisions that we that we are making and asking you to, to um, uh, approve. Uh, for the revenue side, we are, uh, we are asking that our rates match exactly that of PG&E, um, uh, and that will keep that issue off of the table uh, as far as uh, uh, how to answer the customer question when it comes at us, it's like, how do you compare to PG&E? And instead of trying to say we're 1% below or 1% above or 5% um, or below or any number for that matter, we can just simply they say that we are exactly matching uh, PG&E's uh, rates and uh, you will never pay anything more to, for us or to us than what you would otherwise pay to PG&E, um, uh, assuming that you stayed with, with, uh, with them for the generation side. However, we differ in a number of ways. Uh, one is the resources that we're going to source, uh, the resources that we're going to buy are greener, definitely, than uh, what PG&E has been doing for you on your behalf for years. Uh, we, in fact, we're going to try to go all the way to 100% carbon free if we can, if we can help it and to, to get there. Uh, two, we're going to have programs that are more uh, custom tailored to our region that will meet our needs. Uh, and three, we will have sufficient money left over that we can give you back some money at the end of the year as cash rebate. Now we discussed this with you and with the with the operations board last month, 
and you ask us to come back with uh, with some numbers and that's exactly what we have done the w- the way this eventually would look like to the extent that we match BGE on the rate side we're going to have somewhere around um, uh, what looks like um, at least for 2017 2018 a little over 40 million dollars um, of net revenue uh, that's out of 120 million dollars total revenue for for the, for the first fiscal year of operation and the approach that we are recommending to you is to uh, divvy up that money uh, in the following fashion uh, we will start by making sure that we are buying as close to 100 percent carbon free as possible as i've indicated earlier will all the rps requirements that we are obligated to will get that from type one resources basically local to california resources or dynamically could be scheduled into california and uh, and then with the rest um, which that will be about th- almost 30 percent of our needs uh, if not more if we can get it and the rest will will uh, buy uh, large hydro uh, premiums in order to make sure that we are getting close to 100 percent carbon free uh, then one percent of our total revenue will dedicate that to programs that will be about 1.2 million dollars given the fact that we're not going to be collecting money until sometime in may even though we're starting operation in march yeah, it takes a couple of months before the money actually start to flow so sometime between may and the end of september that's the time when we can actually spend money on programs before then we can't because we don't have any money to spend on programs we are we are still asking that we dedicate about one percent of our total revenue or 1.2 million dollars towards the the programs that we can do for this year and these programs by the way are not power acquisition programs these are programs like uh, battery charges i I mean uh, 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 car charges uh, uh, cleaner cars that we can probably rebate for some of the customers um, and other number of programs that could help uh, one reduce greenhouse gas emission to increase um, increase consumption of electricity that's carbon free and um, then after that we're going to be left with somewhere around uh, 37 38 million dollars and what we are suggesting for 2017 2018 only to allocate that on a 10 percent 90 percent 10 percent will go back to the customer as cash rebate or or credit at the end of the year uh, and to address the issue that that was um, uh, presented to us last time we met and talked about this, uh, about transitory uh, uh, customers coming in and moving in and out constantly, we will always be able to give those folks their dividends or their their uh, rebate once they move out. All they have to do is just tell us where they move to, and we'll send them a check uh, for for their share of the rebate. And that rebate is um, for 2017, 2018, uh, comes to about $3.5 million, which roughly amounts to about 3% of our total revenue. So in a sense, we are given a discount of 3%, but instead of doing it monthly, we are doing it at at the end of the year uh, on a one-time basis. And the other 90% of the leftover, of the, out of that $38 million left over, we'll put that in reserves. We think by, uh, in about two and a half years, we'll be able to collect enough uh, to put money in reserves that will help us meet at least, have enough money in there to meet uh, 50% of our operating expenses uh, comes um, 2020. Uh, and if we are there, then we are have enough cushion to be able to go out and, and support development if we want to develop uh, resources on our own and instead of always um, uh, buying it and support local development of, of resources and I'm assuming by 2020 that the, the cost of solar as well as uh, as well as um, uh, battery charges will will come down even further and uh, will help and make it easy for us to be able to come to you make a recommendation for local uh, development of resources. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll conclude my presentation. Happy to entertain any questions. Okay, I'll uh, bring this bit to the board before I open to the public. Uh, you know, we had a conversation on this uh, last uh, meeting, but uh, Mr. Kaufman, don't miss. 
Um, just, to, just a comment about this. Um, for the public to be aware that the reserves are required not only for the purpose of the financing, but also for the strength of the, the company to build up. And that's one reason why we're significant for the first year or two out. And, um, and that's why we're not often spending it all as we get it in, and why it's important for us to be conservative the, the first round or two. Yes. Oh, yes, Mr. Delgado. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Tom, the, can you go back to that pie chart, please? Yes, of course. Simple question. So given what you've told us, year two and year three, the pie chart might look substantially similar or not? Um, obviously, the, the, the dollar amount is going to be different because this is just partial year. We, this is revenues coming from uh, March 1st through September last uh, from only 60% of the customer base, which is the commercial customers, commercial agriculture as well as industrial, uh, as well as three months worth of uh, residential customer revenues. So it's a, it's a short year, so to speak. Um, for the following years, we are likely to see more like $250 million worth of um, revenue coming in to the agency. Uh, and the net revenue is going to be probably in the $50 million, assuming that we don't have legislation that will set us back uh, or PCIA going up again and so on. Uh, so the numbers will be a little different. The allocation, however, uh, at least in my head, I'm suggesting that probably for next year, uh, the money left over after we buy cleaner resources and after we dedicate a portion to programs, the money left over probably the split, I would recommend that it, instead of being a 90-10, 90 towards reserves, 10 towards uh, customer rebate, I would recommend that it will be 80-20, and maybe the following year will be 70-30. So basically reducing the amount of money being pushed into reserves because by then we're going to have enough and increasing the amount of money uh, being given back to customer rebates. Uh, and uh, after three years, I think we should have enough money in reserves that we'll be able to even push the amount of money that we are dedicating to, um, to uh, programs uh, instead of being 1%. Uh, of revenues, it will be 2%, maybe 3%. Um, and the amount of money being dedicated to uh, going back to the customer probably will be uh, higher. So is the total reserve that we'd like to have in a few years approximately in the 125 million, 150 million range? About there, yes. So until we get there, we'll, we'll be seeing a bulk of the net revenue going there. That's correct, yes. To the extent that you're okay with that. Okay, and I don't want to get us off topic, so <clears throat> tell me if this next question should be asked at a different place. Uh, my question is, when could existing local power producers, and I'm thinking of the landfill to gas production at the regional uh, waste management district, when, can, when could local existing service providers uh, come in to uh, be providing us uh, power? Uh, to, to the extent... Um, and more specifically to the folks at the landfill, where, and I've already had a discussion with uh, with a number of those folks. Uh, these type of programs we need to be talking about, we can talk about now. Uh, it takes them a little time to actually develop those resources, uh, but it, they are smaller, small enough that they certainly will not uh, make any substantial uh, dent in our uh, in our um, uh, revenue so I, I definitely want to be talking to, to them about it now whether it's landfill uh, projects or some of the folks that want to do some uh, local solar on the, on the you know, facilities rooftop uh, they don't need to wait that they uh, unless of course they want to do something that will be um, a larger facility that they want to build somewhere in the county that isn't belonging to any of the cities and not required by any of the cities, uh, then they can always go into that um, RFO and put in an offer. Um, All right, and so to I the extent that it's the, the price of it is close enough to, uh, to what we are seeing from other bettors, then we'll come back to you and see if you want to give any preference uh, to those folks. Right now, the numbers that I've heard, and so you just understand where I'm coming from, 
for some of the local generators, they they are talking about you know they want a long term contract for eight and a half cents a kilowatt hour. Where I know I can get it from the market at somewhere around two and a half cents a kilowatt hour. So uh, some of the very local ones that just want to build around town, one megawatt here, two megawatt there. I don't think they they're that economical, but there are ones that are saying that we can build something in Monterey County, uh, we can bring the price down to maybe four cents or three and a half cents a kilowatt hour. Now, then we're getting into the ballpark where we can um, work out um, uh, an arrangement that will be uh, one, beneficial to, to local generation and, and two, um, uh, is not too far out from what we can get from the marketplace today. Okay, so just to clarify earlier, I thought you indicated that if, if we're going to have to invest in a n development of a new power source, that sort of arrangement is going to have to wait down the road until we have money to invest. But if there's currently a power producer at the right price that doesn't require our investment of capital, th those are the kinds of producers that we would be amenable to discussion. Yeah, anyone that, with the money that wants to build something and want to sell us the output for the long term, uh, to the extent that the price for that output is reasonable, uh, then yeah, of course, they can come and talk to us right away. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Okay. Yes, uh, uh, Supervisor Parker. Thanks, Mr. Chair. As, as the um, share of the money going into reserves um, diminishes as we build the reserves, <coughs> um, as a practical matter for customers, can we take if if 10% going back into uh, back to customers is about a 3% um, reduction in their rate? Would then 20% be 6%? I mean, does it track that way? Uh, probably, approximately. Yes, it does. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I think um, this is a very prudent approach to take. Um, Power, uh, money and power, so to speak, go hand in hand, so to speak, but uh, it can be a very volatile uh, situation too. And uh, just having experienced what we've experienced from Sacramento in this last um, week, I think it's uh, uh, doubly prudent for us to have a, a very good reserve because who knows what might be coming. Uh, I mean, do you think that's a, I think that's something that we should be adding into the uh, the mix too, just as a consideration, because we never know what's coming there. It's uh, it often surprises you, and it surprises you in the last minute. And I think that's why we're making this recommendation to be a 2017, 2018. We we we're not saying we ought to do it this way. Yeah, for the next five years, we being very cautious because you don't know what's to, what will come next year. And when it comes to allocation of the of that net revenue. Uh, we are basically saying we'll just put 90% of reserves and 10%. We're not saying specifically how much. We're just saying 90% is going this way, 10% is going to go that way. Uh, and then we will wait until the end of the fiscal year to find out how much money we still have left. And that will tell us how much will eventually end up going in reserves and how much will go in rebates. And that's why I like the idea of rebates more so than I like a discount because the discount assumes that that next year is going to look that way and so you just offer the three percent month in and month out then surprise at the end of the year you may end up with something entirely different uh, that's why i like to wait until the end of the year to see maybe that ten percent will become four percent and i mean the ten percent out of the total will become four percent or five percent not just three percent so that's why I'm recommending just to, to offer the rebate at the end of the year and also to build the reserves as fast as you possibly can. And is the uh, the 50 percent um, of operating expenses? That's uh, you're real comfortable. You don't want, you know, we don't need to go 60 or 70 or something like that. I mean, <laughs> that's a is that a base or is that just a comfort zone? This is a, a comfort zone just at the beginning of of operations. It's just a number to shoot at with a certain min and a max, but. Eventually, in a year or two, once we have a clear indication of all the forces that can change our power supply cost, once we have what the value of risk is looking like and, and all the other um, issues that may become uh, uh, expensive in the future, we'll be able to kind of pin down that number more scientifically and be able to calculate it more effectively and then 
maybe you will end up with 30% and instead of 50%, or maybe you'll end up with 60%, as you mentioned. Okay. Um, any other questions from the member board members? Uh, any questions from the public? Any comments? Uh, good morning. I'm uh, Kevin Smith uh, with Energy Systems International in Monterey. And I just wanted to give you an observation on adding hydroelectric to your supply mix. Uh, hydroelectric energy provides some more reliable sources of energy in, in terms of 24 hours per day or per season. Uh, it's less intermittent than wind and solar, and, and I develop those types of projects. But it does provide a more steady flow of electricity, for, uh, particularly in a 24-hour period. So I just wanted to make that observation for you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Michael Saint from uh, Aptos, uh, representing uh, Citizens Climate Lobby. Uh, for those of you not clear on that, that's basically a carbon fee and dividend that we've been doing federally for over a decade now. Um, I just have a few questions. Uh, but basically, first, I want to tell you that CCL is very supportive of Monterey Community Power, as well as my other group that I belong to, Sensible Transportation. Um, they got on all last night and sent me emails and made phone calls for this. And so I'll continue to do that through Friday at midnight, I guess you said. OK, so I'll get to my other group at 11 o'clock today. Um, I just have a few questions about the CCE. Um, I understand we're totally in the first stages of this. This is a little bit more in the future. Um, sounds like a really good pro uh, job that you're doing here, but I had a question about the federal tax credits. Um, since the solar ones are going to be phasing out on December 31st, uh, 2019, will there be some type of uh, priority to get some build out of solar infrastructure started before that date, just so we could take advantage of that? That's about a 30% decrease in your costs. Um, also, related to the above question about federal tax credits expiring, um, will we think of ways to maybe incentivize our customers to go solar? Uh, they will have lost these incentives, um, as well as our windows are squeezing down on our net metering. So some of the incentives that we've had for the last uh, few years are going to be going away, and I just was wondering, is Monterey be Community Power going to do something for our customers so the less fortunate possibly, and those of you that are on the border of putting solar up have some reason to do it. Uh, some of these might be an assistance pricing, especially for those who can't afford it as presently priced. Um, also, a premium rate for excess energy produced uh, would be an incentive, monthly credits uh, at market rates on a daily production times. Uh, Feed-in tariffs, um, and the one that concerns me a little bit most, I looked at the Marin County one last night, did some research. They seem to be going along the same line as PG&E. And I'm wondering, are we bound by PG&E's uh, structure on net metering? Because it's almost identical. Uh, and what's happening is the window for ma uh, maximum production for our customers, roof solar, is shrinking. Um, and I'm wondering if it's possible, or have we looked at the old E7 and then the E6 rates that were so incentivizing that a lot of people jumped on rooftop solar. Um, can we look at those and maybe introduce those or are we bound by PG&E because they're doing the billing? Because uh, they're going to have their customers doing a different net metering. So I was a little disappointed with the Marin County's things. They've also discontinued E6 at the same time PG&E did. So I thought we had some effect on that. I believe our goal here is to provide clean, renewable energy at affordable rates. Uh, so I would suggest we look at our uh, present local infrastructure to try to do some of the build out, uh, you know, residential rooftops, buildings, empty structures uh, that can be used uh, to produce power now and not have to wait for these expensive infrastructure build outs. I believe this could save us millions over the future years and could be used to lower rates and assist those uh, that do not have the financial means to pay high energy bills. Thank you. Do you want, uh, Mr. Basha, do you want to answer any, any of those um, concerns or questions? Sure. I, I think, um, and we're going to get to talk um, extensively about that when we 
put together a workshop <coughs> so we can define what kind of programs we want to get we, we want to engage in in the future uh, there has been obviously in the last 10 to 15 years the the notion that putting solar on a rooftop is a good thing and should be encouraged and utilities should pay for it um, not just retail rates but even more if possible in order to bring as much of these resources as you possibly can bring in that has um, uh, got us here in california from having somewhere around 500 megawatt of solar uh, rooftops and solar resources to what we have today which is more than a 10,000 megawatts of, of solar now uh, um, that exist in California. Uh, that brings a new set of problems and um, that get us to a point where at times those who have developed and paid for these resources are actually having to pay other people, other states. The state of California has been paying the state of Arizona in order to take some of these, some of the generation coming from solar um, in, in the past, at least in the first quarter of 2017, one third of the time, the solar is, was being sold at negative prices. Uh, perhaps Marin is doing what they are doing because they realize that uh, they cannot afford to continue to buy solar at nine cents, then sell it at a negative price to another wholesaler because if you don't do it that way, then we're going to have a problem um, with, the, with the grid reliability. Uh, I'm not saying that people ought to stop doing it, but there are considerably other uh, programs out there that I believe could be a lot more uh, positive towards, um, uh, towards a, a cleaner environment. Um, electric cars, <coughs> electric car chargers, uh, there are a number of other, uh, you can put electric water heaters and, 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 uh, and space heaters uh, into new homes. There are a lot of ideas out there today that we can spend money on that will be helpful, not just to reduce greenhouse gas, but to reduce the cost for, for the customers here in, in Monterey County, uh, in, in Monterey um, Bay community um, power, but also uh, that will uh, reduce substantially the problems that we have in today on the grid because of the over investment that we have done in solar. One of the things that we are doing, for example, uh, with the RFO that we are doing jointly with Silicon Valley Clean Energy is uh, saying to suppliers that, and basically we're going after wind and solar. We are saying to the solar suppliers, if you do put an offer, you need to couple your solar with, uh, with uh, energy storage. Uh, because without it, even though it's going to cost us a little bit more, uh, but we know that if we don't do that, eventually we're just helping, um, that, uh, that helping that system to a collapse at one point. And it will, ha it will happen here as it did in Germany in, uh, a couple of years ago when they've just over... Um, done it on the solar side because what happens is you only get the solar when the sun is shining and before the, when the sun starts to come in you have to ramp down all the natural gas resources that are operating on the grid today when the sun goes down you have to ramp up all those resources and the grid operators are running into a problem where they cannot, cannot do that effectively anymore and eventually that could lead into real bad problems to the grid. So we are doing everything that we can do to, to, to help. We don't want to overdo it anymore, especially on the solar, because we know there are certain issues that, that, uh, that comes with it. We do want to encourage folks um, here in this area to begin looking at other ways of reducing the emission of greenhouse gas reducing that to, to, uh, to a size, especially on the transportation side. Okay, yes, Mr. Termini. Tom, could you answer the question, are we required to follow the same regulations with regard to net metering that PG&E does? No, we do not. We can, um, we can create our own 
rates however we we feel appropriate uh, at this point because of simplicity and because we are matching uh, pg e on the rates, um, we are likely to do that for Thank the you. energy metering, yes. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, from the public, yes. Thank you, Chairman McPherson and uh, board members <clears throat> and Mr. Habashi. Um, I'm Rod Fickle with Zero City uh, from Capitola. Um, other uh, CCAs also have uh, a rate opportunity for um, rate payers to pay a premium for local, uh, locally green generated uh, electricity. And I'm just wondering if that opportunity is going to be uh, for the MBCP region as well. And what that does is help uh, local renewable energy development. Um, the other thing that uh, I, I believe MCE is doing is charging um, or paying a premium for a locally developed uh, green energy um, as part of their wholesale price. Uh, it, I believe it was six cents rather than four. Um, that could partially be um, possibly paid for by individuals or, or businesses who decide not to take their rebate every year. And rather than that, revenue could be used for uh, locally developed energy. So just a suggestion. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Okay, we'll bring it back to the board. Um, this is a, an action item um, to approve the rate design and uh, the disposition of the net revenue. Um, I'll move staff recommendation. Motion, second. Any other questions? Yes, Mr. Delgado. A question on the rate design. More menu pick. Yeah, uh, we we haven't yet talked about the the product offerings or, or which will be a different redesign, if you will. And uh, uh, the speaker was correct that all other CCAs uh, as well as we will uh, offer customers to the 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 opportunity to pay a little extra, so we can take that money and direct it towards buying more of California green resources. Uh, and there's another product that I'm still thinking about, and I, I eventually I'd like to vet it and make sure that it would work. Um, uh, the, and that product would be to uh, perhaps for, for some of the customers to forego uh, the, the rebates that they're going to get at the end of the year and give them the opportunity to tell us how they would like to direct that money, whether to direct it towards more green resources or perhaps to provide more assistance to low-income families. Uh, so we still playing around with the with the products. We will we'll definitely bring it back to you. This is, uh, I know it's a very important thing to to, to the policy board. Um, so in the next meeting, uh, I'll have that list coming your way for for eventually for approval. And a question on your net metering discussion you provided us moments ago. Uh, so so we'll be we'll be paying solar roof generators homeowners. Uh, we'll be dealing with them the same that PG&E does, financially speaking? Ye yes, that's the intent. Okay. And so given your discussion earlier to us, am I correct in thinking that every house that has solar is actually going to uh, cost us money as, a, as, an as, as an agency? Because we'll be paying them much more than we'll be paying the wholesale contractors. Uh, PGE is in the process, and we will go obviously along with that of doing uh, what they term as time of use rates, and uh, they actually will be changing how much they pay for what type of resource um, based on the based on what the market price for that resource um, uh, is at the time the resource is producing. Uh, for example. The, in the past, they offer time of use that would be from um, uh, 10 o'clock in the morning, from 8 o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock at night. They consider that to be on peak pricing, and they offer nine cents for that. Uh, that all that's going to change when they do uh, real time pricing or uh, um, uh, real time pricing based on 
their study of what the resources, what the resource value at that time will be comes 2019. Most likely we're going to find, for example, what used to be on peak, what they paid a um, higher price for is no longer the case, especially that time during the day between um, 12 o'clock and uh, uh, afternoon to 2 or 3 o'clock uh, in the afternoon. That used to be the most expensive. Uh, that's no longer the case because that's the time when most of the solar is coming in at a, at a very cheap price. So that's now the new off-peak is during the, the hottest time of the day. Uh, and that's, the, that's what pg e will be offering to solar suppliers, whether on rooftops or, or otherwise. So it's a supply-demand situation, and as pg e changes, if we don't change our policy from what it's going to start out to be, ours will change along with theirs. Yeah, it, at this point, it's it, by approving that we match pg es rates, we are just automatically adjusting as they adjust. Um, and uh, uh, unless, of course, you're down the, down the road, if we see something that they are doing that just way off, we'll have to come back and, and discuss it with you. Okay. Come on. Yes, Supervisor Parker. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just want to say that um, I appreciate this discussion and uh, being able to um, think this through. I do. I, I am aware that quite a number of people in our area are very price sensitive, so I appreciate that we're looking for a way to um, have uh, people pay a price that's less than, uh, or have the option to pay a price that's less than PG&E. Um, and I'm uh, I recognize I'm kind of a prudent uh, financial type myself, so um, as much as I would like to have the um, the discount or the rebate to customers be a little larger um, at at the beginning, I can see that that really isn't um, the the best way to proceed to really build us into a sustainable organization. So. Um, uh, but uh, I appreciate the information that you offered that I don't think was in our uh, packet that um, over, uh, actually it was I think um, last month um, in the discussion that as we build the reserve then we'll have the ability to um, allocate a greater portion of the net revenue to um, uh, customer rebates. Um, and I, I also, uh, I like the idea uh, in, in my, um, and we talked about this last time, I like the idea of a, a discount that people get every month, um, but I know that's more expensive for the, um, you know, administratively, um, and that it's not so much that it's going to be very obvious. Um, so I think the, the rebate is a, is a, you know, a decent um, compromise or a way to do it. So I appreciate the thought uh, that's gone into this and the discussion, and I'm comfortable uh, with the um, the way that we're approaching this. Okay. Thank you very much. We have a motion and a second. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Carried unanimously. Okay, we will go to um, the um, uh, item number six, approval of the uh, Monterey Bay Community Power Fiscal Year 2017-18 budget, and this is an action item. I think you can advance it. Well, uh, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have, uh, as you um, recall, we just got the budget change last month. We changed the budget from March, from April to March. We changed that into um, October 1st to September last. So we just that we done that last month, and obviously that necessitates that we have a, put a budget together for the budget year 27 fiscal year 2017-2018. Uh, I apologize for the for the simplicity of of this budget. Usually, you are accustomed to budgets that come in in books um, <laughs> and incredibly detailed. Um, this budget isn't. It's just coming in in one small, simple page, and and probably the reason for that is that almost 95 percent of the total cost uh, of our operation is really going to buying resources. Um, and to dispatch and schedule those resources. The rest is just administrative cost and, and staff cost and whatnot. Um, the budget before you is likely to change uh, once we have an idea about what the power supply costs will be. Um, um, and also once we have clear determination of what the race of PG&E will, will look like and 
that will define what our revenue is going to be. Uh, these numbers will change six months from now at the time when we do a, a budget uh, uh, adjustment. Uh, probably the person that will be making that presentation will be a finance manager who will take these numbers that you see before you and probably break it down in a way that you are more accustomed to. So um, with that, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm going to end my presentation and ask you if uh, you could approve um, the budget for, two, for fiscal year 2017-2018. Okay, is there any comments from the members of the board on the proposed budget? Any, anybody? Oh, excuse me, Mr. Delgado. Thank you. So as always, um, staffing is a major component of the cost of operations, in this case, 2.4 million approximately. And my question is, uh, considering the table of organization that was displayed earlier, how many, how many positions does this 2.4 million fill on that table of organization? Um, we, we're gonna try to bring in about eight people in the first four months. Uh, then uh, in, the, in the next four months. Then after that, we'll, in the following six months, we'll bring in the rest of the staff, which amounts to about 18 or 19, I believe, uh, at this point. Uh, that also is going to probably change slightly, but I'm, I'm fairly comfortable with maybe somewhere between 20 to 25 people are, are good enough for our operation. If you really take the total cost of staffing um, uh, the agency, and add to that the benefits and everything else, including professional services that we're going to get. All that will amount to roughly less than 2% of our total operating budget uh, on a fiscal year basis. Okay, so by September 30th, 2018, at the end of this budget in front of us, is it foreseen that there would be about 20 to 25 employees? At, uh, Somewhere around 20, if, um, yeah, it will be less, definitely less than 20 because the number that you have seen in the um, organization chart that we shared with you is about, what, 18? Mm -hmm. uh, about 18 people total. Uh, eventually, we're probably going to bring in summertime folks and, and uh, interns and whatnot. The number may eventually total maybe 25. Okay. So just a ballpark for us to consider as board members. Uh, during the course of this year, we may end up with about 18 people who are employees, and then there'll be other contracts for professional services, and together that will equal about 2.4 million projection. Uh, inclusive of the repayment to Santa Cruz, I'm told. So it says here. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, the question. Uh, um, it looks like the after the first year will we have retired any debt that we incur. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. I, and uh, yes, I, I don't see why we can't. I, I know that uh, at Silicon Valley they already retired both the, the non-revolving and the revolving line of credits um, four months into their operation. Is there anything in this budget that I'm missing that showing any debt service on the portion that we use? Uh, if you see it the, uh, in the revenue side for the for this budget, you're going to see three million dollars line of credit. Right. That's the non-revolving line of credit. The other is just it's not shown here because we don't, we, don't, we don't touch it. This is just to deal with the power supply side of the equation. Uh, in this budget, there's a three million dollars into the revenues, and uh, I believe it's also included in the expenses. And the, the expense side of it includes the interest on any of that revol any of that line of credit yes. that we used. It's three point one, so we're borrowing three million, we give them back three point one. We're estimating that the total interest will be about a hundred thousand dollars. Wonderful, thank you. Any other questions on the budget? Uh, comments from the members of the public? Anybody have a comment? Okay. Um, would entertain a motion. I'll move the budget. Second. Move the second that we approve the budget for 2017-18, October 1st to September 30th. It's October 1st, 2017 to, uh, to September 30th, 2018. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carries unanimously. We will now go to the approval of the banking and credit services agreement with River City Bank, and this is where we had the revisions that were mentioned earlier as well. Correct. Hi, good morning. Of the board. I'm Peter Doubtless with the uh, Santa Cruz County Office of Economic Development. 
The uh, ad hoc finance committee with representatives from the three counties have been working with River City Bank throughout the summer to negotiate a credit agreement that's before you here today. At this time, we've received loan approval for the startup funding and the working capital line. Can you get a little closer to your mic? I sure please? can. Yeah, thanks. Um, the terms of the agreement are substantially consistent with those received to Silicon Valley um, Clean Energy Authority. And the operations board reviewed these uh, agreements at their last meeting uh, last week and recommended approval to you. Um, the agreement uh, is, is kind of broken into two parts, uh, the first being the non-revolving line, non -revolving line of credit. This provides up to $3 million in startup funding. Uh, River City Bank is requiring credit support from the three counties uh, for the um, uh, for the guarantee or for the, the line of credit. The term is for 12 months and there is an option to extend to 15 months, 15 months for repayment. To the extent that there aren't revenues sufficient to you know repay the line entirely within that uh, first 12 to 15 month period, there is an option to convert to a term loan for five years uh, with 60 equal pa payments. The interest is paid monthly and it can be paid through the an advance on the line in the advance and before having revenue. And the, the interest rate is based on one month LIBOR plus a margin. The second piece is a revolving line of credit. Uh, and this provides working capital for MBCP up, uh, up to $10 million. Um, the terms are substantially similar to the non-revolving. Oh, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Um, with the term of 12 months, uh, again, there's an option to term out the loan uh, at, uh, for five years. The interest is almost pay also paid monthly. Uh, with a month, one month, one month low, LIBOR plus a margin. The one difference with this is that it does require a debt service reserve that is put in place uh, at the beginning of uh, the line equal to $1.1 million, and that also can be established with an initial advance on the line. Also before you today is what we're calling a guarantor agreement, um, and this is related only to the non-revolving line of credit. Um, this is requiring the NBCP um, uh, seek written uh, uh, approval for amendments from the counties as the guarantee, uh, guarantors providing credit support. The term of this agreement uh, is through the time in which the non-revolving line of credit is released from River City Bank. So with that, today we're asking for you to uh, approve the recommendations. And uh, Tom and I and Rosa Cachia from River City Bank are here to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you for your work on that, Mr. Dedliff. That's right. Any other comments from Mr. Habashi? Yeah. Uh, just work. a very quick comment. I, I, I do want to acknowledge all the hard work that went into this. There's a considerable number of people that have uh, put a lot of effort in, to getting these agreements together, and uh, no one put as much time and effort than Peter, so I, I, I just want to give a shout out to him. Thank you. Good. Yes, sir. Mr. Gar. Yes. Uh, LIBOR, it's London investment offered, earner bank offered rate. I heard at a city meeting that it might be going away. And I, uh, what's the update? I think it's the LIBOR or its replacement, if I remember correctly, but maybe uh, Rosa can answer that. Rosa Kuchich of Observer City Bank, you're correct. Um, there is um, some talk about LIBOR being phased out over the next few years. Um, with that, um, I'm not concerned with this credit agreement since it's, it's relatively short term. If in fact um, LIBOR were to be phased out, we would replace it with an equivalent rate, um, uh, an index that, that we can easily track. Um, off the top of my head, I probably think we would use either a prime rate or um, equivalent would be a, a one month treasury note, um, uh, uh, or treasury yield on, on a, a U.S. treasury. Questions, yes. That, that was certainly the question that I had about the LIBOR, knowing um, they're looking at some changes there. And the um, the document, I think, page 45, and it tells about the the credit margin is equal to one and a quarter for the LIBOR. Our margin is 1.75. Um, and it does say that it uses a lender discretion for a change of the index. Um, can you also let the public know how much time it would be before there would be a change so that we know when a no notification process would occur? Yes. Um, what we would do is, you know, if, if we did uh, receive 
notification that LIBOR would be going away, we would give Tom a call and tell him that uh, we need to uh, update the loan agreement, um, and we would probably just do an amendment or even just a letter. Um, it, it depends on kind of, uh, you know, what would be the best approach. Um, and uh, we would try to do that in, in a very timely manner. I can't give you exactly what the time frame is, but, you know, we'd, we'd of course, want to make sure that, that it's taken care of and, and, and knowing that the borrower and the lender um, are aware of what the rate is at the time. Yeah. I want to add quickly that, uh, as you probably know, the considerable amount of financial transactions are based on LIBOR, and um, it, it's not going to go away. When, when it's decided that for it to go away, it's going to take uh, probably more years than months. And uh, by then, we would definitely be uh, done with this, uh, with this loan. Yes. Yeah. Do you guys have any other questions I can answer for you right here? Any questions? Um, any questions from the public that I ask? Uh, we will bring it back to the board. Um, to uh, This is an action item to approve the banking and credit services agreement with River City Bank. I'll move the approval. Second. Okay, okay second. Uh, any other comments from the board? Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. Uh, item number eight, adopt a resolution regarding the approval of the CEO contract and expense authorization, authorization limit. This is an action item. Thank you, Laurel, if you could put the thank you. All right. So uh, this, this item is uh, pursuant to section 3.4 of the JPA document authorizing the CEO to execute agreements up to $100,000 um, with three conditions. One, that these uh, expenditures would be consistent with the approved budget. Two, that the agreements would be approved as to form by our general counsel. And three, that the agreements would all be reported out at the next board meeting. And the reason that we are coming before you today with this um, authorization request is that there are going to be a number of expenditures uh, that Tom is is um, entering into right now in order to meet the accelerated date of March 2018 for launch. Um, these do not include contracts that will exceed $100,000 relative to the power procurement and all this, the other discussions we've had earlier. This is really for admin operations, office, you know, uh, rent, equipment, all that sort of thing. Um, I also just want to point out that this policy is consistent with uh, several other CCAs, including Sonoma Clean Power and East Bay Community Energy, uh, just so that you know there is a precedent for this. So we are requesting uh, this authorization today. It was uh, recommended for approval by the Operations Board last week. Are there any questions? Thank you. Any questions? Uh, Supervisor Parker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, when it says agreements are reported to the next board meeting, does that mean policy board? Uh, well, operations. it would be at the policy board and the operations board, but because the operations board meets monthly, it would always be part of that monthly and then reported then when you meet next. Thank you. Questions? Okay, we have a motion and a second. For Move this. approval. Second. Motion second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So ordered unanimously. We we're on a roll here. Uh, yeah. Number nine, the marketing and community outreach update. I want to thank Mr. Mansfield, too, for all the work he has done to this time. Good morning. There it is. We good? Um, first of all, I just wanted to report that I've, I understand the website is back up. Why is it not working? Is this not working? Yeah, get, we'll get closer then. There we go. I want to report that the website is back on, uh, working, apparently. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's an old car that, we're <laughs> that we've inherited the website, and we try to keep that thing on the road um, every day. And, uh, and it's been up and down back. during this meeting. Yeah. It's, uh, OK, so what I wanted to do was to um, expand a little bit upon the um, uh, staff report that um, is part of the agenda today by providing a little bit of visual and um, uh, provide you an opportunity to um, give me feedback 
um, on the um, marketing and outreach. So um, what we have uh, before you at the moment is the, um, what we call the um, accordion fold mini brochure. And um, this is a brochure that has been updated um, mildly to keep its usability um, going while we um, take a look at the core messages for the program. And I'm actually going to go back a slide. Um, and the reason why I bring up that piece is that getting the core messages nailed down and updated for Monterey Bay Community Power is the primary job that we're facing right now and the work that is being done by both boards with regard to the rate design and the development of products is greatly going to influence what our core messages are so um, I know that there's a lot of desire to get out there in the community and engage and get all of the different platforms and channels moving and what we're doing is sort of balancing as best we can um, in this interim period of time where we have the legacy messages that uh, were developed with Monterey Bay Community Power over the last couple of years but not quite yet um, nailed down with regard to rate design and the products that will be offered. So um, we're excited about the actions that are being taken by both of the boards over the last couple of weeks in that regard so that we can get um, those core messages nailed down and move them forward. So um, the printed piece of collateral that you see on the screen now is, um, it's about the size, if you haven't seen it before, it's about the size of a, a mobile phone. It is um, a useful piece because it has Spanish on one side and English on the other, and it's a small size. It's easy to hand out at events. Um, we were able to do a reprint of these because the volume of message that is in this piece is pretty minimal. So the um, actions with regard to rate design and products don't influence this piece a whole lot. So we were able to um, keep that one moving forward. Other things like fact sheets and FAQs and those kinds of deeper dive pieces of printed collateral that are very helpful at tabling events and whatnot, those are the ones that are affected by this sort of interim period as we hone things. So speaking of community engagement, we again, keeping with the theme of balancing in this interim period before we really have things dialed in, we are sponsoring um, all three county fairs. Um, Santa Cruz County Fair is underway now. Um, a week ago or so was the Monterey County Fair. Um, we had an opportunity to table last weekend um, at the um, National Drive Electric event that was in downtown Santa Cruz. We are working with our partner and affiliated um, support groups um, throughout the region to help develop what um, the right events are that we can attend. We can't go to everything, um, but we're working with um, the Romero folks and Green Power. We're working with labor. We're working with um, various individuals that have worked hard over time, and we'll keep adding to the number of people that we're engaging with to develop those opportunities. Uh, the biggest challenge besides getting through this interim time of not having all of our materials quite there yet, the biggest challenge is that we can't get to everything. So it's going to be how do we make the biggest impact um, with available budget and available time um, this fall. Another um, significant activity is media engagement, and that's working with our local media and regional media um, to keep Monterey Bay Community Power um, top of mind for them. Um, what you see in this particular visual is uh, the work that we did to um, promote Tom coming on board, and um, you can see um, the Monterey Herald's coverage of that. And then also um, earlier this week, um, the work to um, address what was going on in Sacramento that we heard a lot about at the beginning of the meeting today. Um, that was a, a big task by all. Social media, we continued. There are various platforms that have been set up for Monterey Bay Community Power, including Facebook and Instagram and YouTube um, and a couple of others. Right now, we are um, um, uh, bringing back to life, if you will, after a, a period of a few months of, of dormancy as we 
waited for the JPA to get formed and budgets to get approved. We're focusing on bringing uh, Instagram and, and Facebook back to life and we're getting some good engagement on both of those. So with that said, um, the other uh, major projects that I think are top of mind for everybody, I'm, I know I've heard from several of you about, about a couple of these, the website that is underway, I'm happy to report. The um, content is being developed, the look and feel is being developed, and I'm very optimistic that we're going to be able to get that new site up probably early October. I'm gunning hard to make it by the end of this month. Um, I think that, that we need to get that site up absolutely as soon as possible. We're also, we're, we're also working on um, updating the video that has been well received over time, but it is an aspirational video that talks about what could be, but what could be actually is, so we've got to have a video that supports that. We are preparing um, advertising. Again, this is an, an issue that gets back to those core messages being developed. We can't get um, a lot of advertising going without having those messages dialed in, obviously. But we are um, communicating with um, various outlets throughout the, the region that are not TV. Um, TV is uh, planned for after the first of the year when we're in the enrollment phase. And we are, however, working with uh, television um, representatives to be prepared for that so that we can flip the switch and have that go um, as soon as it's ready. And as I mentioned before, there's other printed collections. residential consumers so maybe having at least a page that that describes if you're an ag consumer here's what this is going to be about um, if you're a residential consumer and then also maybe having the timeline up there so that uh, it's available and um, share with us the link so that we can actually put our you know I'll, we'll do the, the look up for the Facebook and that kind of thing on our end um, because we are the advocates so let's make sure that we are out there for people that recognize us that can outreach to us Thank you. That's great feedback. Uh, Mr. Termini, could you, maybe Tom can answer this question. Where are we with regard to our budget for this item? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask Bill to, to address this, but, but uh, um, we, we know that we will be within, within budget. The, the one thing that I've already shared with, with Bill, I want to share with you that um, in the initial part and before we go ahead and um, and uh, launch the program, um, well, we don't want to be everywhere um, telling everybody what's about to take place because the more you do, uh, the more questions you're going to get and uh, the more you f questions you're going to have to field. And um, we, at least f from my vantage point, um, I think most of our marketing need to happen after lunch when we have programs and we have things that we want to offer that we would like to go out there and promote. Um, at this point, all what we're trying to do is just to let people become aware of who we are, but not to go um, way out because we don't want to spend all of our money that we are borrowing at this point uh, on marketing uh, programs. Perhaps I can be more specific. And first of all, it's worth every penny. You've done a great job. With regard to the initial $87,000 budget, we have spent that, correct? Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm working with a, a current budget that is um, just under 200 that is intended to last to, through the end of uh, December 2017. So, uh, we through to the know, end of this year? Yes. Okay. And, and there's um, certainly interest in um, underspending that budget. 
There's for the points that Tom brought up. There's a unanimous interest in understanding that budget. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions, Supervisor Parker? Uh, thank you. Um, uh, what are you using to uh, develop core messages? Uh, what am I using? Uh, collaboration on the team, um, uh, knowledge of uh, Tom's uh, vision and um, close communication with, with Tom. We have a, an internal working team um, that consists of Tom, uh, Sean Marshall, Jenny Johnson, um, and my team um, with regard to um, developing the um, initial cut on um, products and messaging and everything else we're doing. Great. I, um, I don't know if it would be useful, but because there was a survey done of um, residents in Monterey County, you might be able to tell by the responses to that whether there are messages that resonate with certain populations yes. that might be useful. Um, but I can see sort of the, you know, the emphasis is really on making sure there's general information available um, and really doing a lot more promotion once we have um, um, services and benefits to um, to offer yes and and I have that survey and it's it's very helpful right and it may be as we're doing outreach to customers that that's where those messages come in handy I'm not sure but I just wanted to make sure that, that was in the mix somewhere uh, for whatever it may be worth Thank just you. very quickly to just to add to what Bill said uh, one of the things that I've asked him to do is to wait until we have this meeting first we had the meeting with the operations board and the meeting now with you to to start crafting our message because there are a number of policy uh, issues that you have now approved that we can start to center our discussion and our messaging around he's been looking for the, for for something from me for for quite some time and i told him that once we have this meeting we're going to sit down and we're going to talk about uh, what messages that we need to uh, to start crafting over the next month or so? Okay, Councilman Delgado, do you have a question? Yes, uh, Tom, you kind of drove home the point that we don't want to get ahead of ourselves, and I'm wondering if you can go back to that slide that showed the core messages, Bill. The, I think it was yes, the first slide. It mentions um, provides 100% carbon-free energy. And it was my impression from earlier today that we're going to do our best to get up to 100%. Um, so are we providing 100% or are we providing up to 100%? Close to or something. It, it's really up to, and it's all about the calculations of it more so than whether we can actually spend the money to get us to 100% carbon free. So we'll, that message that you see in there, again, will be talked about and, and revised based on what We've been talking to you and to the operations board uh, for the last couple of months. So we, we're going to hone it a little bit closer to what we eventually want to see uh, in the future, or in the next few months anyway. Thank you. Good job, Bill. Thank all you. Around. And th that question was a perfect example of exactly where we are. And if you think about how that rolls out into how do you do FAQs and how do you arm a person sitting at a table at an event to answer that kind of a question. So. Thank you for pointing that out. Very good. Any other questions? Um, any um, input from any questions from the public? Okay. Um, this um, is just a discussion item, so we do not have to, uh, to have a formal action. Um, that concludes our, our meeting agenda for today. Now, let me... Um, Get clear again when the when the operations board meets and when the policy. What's what are the next meeting dates? I just want to, for the general public to know those are all held here at the Watsonville City Council Chamber. Uh, when does the operations board meet next? Uh, I believe our next meeting is scheduled for October 11th for the operations board and, and that, uh, that was changed I think so I, it used to be the fourth and changed yeah. to the 11th. So that's yes. the operations board here at the Watsonville City Oct October 11th at 9 a.m. That's correct, yes, right here. Okay. And uh, the policy board, uh, perhaps? Policy board meets next on December 13th. December 13th, okay. So everybody have a great Thanksgiving in between. That's hmm. great. Okay, that'll give you more I time to, to print those just minutes. Just one last, one last um, uh, Sean just reminded me that we're going to do a workshop. It will be sometime between October and December for sure. Okay, that should be announced. Do, you, do we know where that's going to be? 
uh, somewhere where we can <laughs> so, <laughs> somewhere where we can we can okay. um, um, host 44 <laughs> people because we're looking for both boards as well as their um, as well as their backups to to the extent that they all can show up definitely not all of them will be able to show up on a single day so we will be coming back to you trying to find a day where we can bring as many people as possible and it will be in one of one of the facilities around in the region i'm sure there's one that will um that will accommodate as many people okay yes what's the workshop on the workshop is just to have the the general overview of the process and where we are and where we're going is yes it's, it's more of a just looking at uh, trying to explain what this business is all about how electricity actually flows from yeah you know, from a supply to an end user uh, what are some of the things that we look at when we go out and acquire resources what are some of the programs available how they affect customers just trying to bring everybody together with this with the sense of reality as we from a staff technical standpoint see it then that will help drive the policies that you folks um, uh, sooner or later will be telling us to um, to follow <laughs> yes it should be I would say it would be roughly about maybe three hours to four hours and okay. would staff with be plenty open? of breaks in between okay. by major would, would staff be open to suggestions from boards uh, board members of uh, desired topics that they can't all get covered but at least you'd you'd hear some suggestions of where we feel ignorant and want more uh, substance it's a very good point and yet yeah, we we will certainly consider it and when we announce it we probably will will try to find out what's the best date for you but also ask you if there are certain topics that you would like to know about okay yes mm -hmm. there's um, a Cal CCA event in October down in Riverside can, yes can we hear a little bit more about that I think that there may be some interest of the board attending yeah, this is uh, uh, the California um, CCA uh, board. This is their annual meeting. Uh, last year, there was their first annual meeting that happened in San Francisco. This year, they are doing it down in uh, down in Riverside. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly, uh, I want to invite, I, I know that we've invited Chair McPherson. And if you are interested, that meeting is going to happen on the 3rd. It's just a single day. Uh, meeting it, the next day will be a meeting of the board of Cal CCA, which is made up of the CEOs of all the operating entities. So most likely, I will be there for those two days. Um, uh, I I know uh, Chairman McPherson is planning to come just for 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 the one day. Um, yeah, if you yeah. have any interest at all in, in uh, participating, please let me know. This is obviously going to be um, uh, this is going to be. Uh, Monterey Bay community power is um, uh, expense. Yeah, I believe at this point what I've understood from the folks that are going to run that meeting, because they're inviting as many of the potential um, uh, potential CCAs, they've asked for the operating members if they could limit the number because we're on any more than 200 because that's the facility that we got is only can accommodate 200 people they're asking uh, to limit the operating entities to three or four people um, so but if you are interested please let me know okay and yeah that's I'm, I'm on a panel discussion on the new startups uh, as a matter of fact so I'm glad we're going to be starting up as planned I if things don't change between now and midnight Friday, anyway. Um, okay, uh, that that is all that we have here. For this meeting is adjourned. Are you